Hello and welcome to Court Games, a Legend of the Five Rings podcast, funded by the Legend of the Five Rings Discord Patreon. This podcast will focus on the role-playing game stories and lore for Legend of the Five Rings. I'm Kova. I'm Kikita Kaori. And this is part two of our look at villages and the rural life in general in Rockagan. Last time we looked at how villages form, the sort of villages that are, the sort of people who might find a village, what village life is like, with a brief overview of the seasons. But this week we are covering rice growing, differences in villages you might find between the different clans, and adventure ideas for villages. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, so I think you're going to start us off with the rice growing season, which is obviously a very, very important part of life in a village. Right. So not every village is growing rice, of course. There are different crops and some areas of land aren't. But because we've, as we've talked about before, rice is so nutrient dense, uh, it is, when properly cared for, it has a huge yield. And basically, it's the currency of Rokugan. And so the pattern of rice growing, which, as we said before, is extremely labor intensive, kind of sets the pattern for life. So I thought we'd actually see what people were doing when with the, specifically the rice crop. So in order to grow rice and get a maximum yield, in the late winter to early spring, the people growing the rice soak the unhulled grains of seed rice. So this is rice they've saved from previous years in water. And then they lay them out in low, flat baskets until they just start to sprout. And then they plant these little sprouts in a starter rice field. In the rice paddy itself, in the early spring, they release water into the paddy. And then they use an oxen and something that kind of looks like a plow to break up the soil of that rice paddy and mix it with straw. Okay? Then they plug back up the field, the paddy, to dry out, and they disinfect it with sunlight. And often at this point, release ducks or chickens into the the paddy to kill pests because they're disinfecting it before the rice crop goes in. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah. And then in the late spring, they reflood the rice paddy, and they add fertilizer to it, which is basically been composted human waste. Yeah. And that prepares it for planting. So they have reflooded the paddy a little less than knee deep and it's ready for for planting at that point. In late spring, early summer, that's when they dig up the planted rice from the nursery field, the starter field. And they tie the shoots into bundles and they take them into the rice paddy. There you get the kind of the classic scene of everybody nearly knee deep in water, one by one putting these individual shoots into the flooded rice paddy by hand. And it's done so that the leaves are a few inches above water. And this is generally done by the whole village. You Sometimes it's set to music, in fact. So everyone's doing it in a kind of a rhythm. But that is that is the classic image that you get of rice farming. The rice grows through the actual summer, but there's still work to be done. So it's checking the water levels morning and night because that's very important so that the water level can be adjusted and so can the levels of fertilizer. And obviously weeds need to be dealt with. In some cases, they're actually, they use the rice paddies for fish as well which I believe is also helpful for getting some of the, the weeds and parasites down. But, it, yeah, it's yet another thing you can do with the water in there. So still very labor-intensive. In late summer, early autumn, the rice paddy is drained, partially to prepare for harvest, but also that is part of what makes the rice yield so high. Essentially what you're doing is you're tricking the rice into thinking that it's going from a flood season into a drought, and so the rice plant will be, I need to make lots and lots of seeds to prepare for a long drought. 
And that's why the harvest can be so good. The rice is harvested in early autumn, early fall, and it's cut with a sickle, the karma that we are so familiar with from mantis people hitting their enemies with it. Cut with a sickle, tied into bundles, and then the bundles are beaten into a box to shake off the rice and break off all the heads until all the rice is harvested. Right. So at that point in the fall, in the autumn, they take the harvested rice back to the village and they dry it. So it gets spread out across a courtyard, a big flat area, and and spread out and raked. And raking it removes the big pieces of rice straw or dirt that, you know, happen to not be left out in the field. Once it has been dried under the sun, then it must be pounded with a mortar and pestle. You know, and this by pestle, we don't mean little pestle, we mean like industrial level, industrial size. So, this is like a big, huge stone mortar that's like knee high and a big post, or it can be ground in an water or oxen or a human driven rice mill, um, kind of like flour is basically. But this is done to remove the bran, the outside coating of the rice, and then it is winnowed which is where it's spread out and tossed in large flat baskets to remove the rice husks. Now, how expensive or you know how white the rice is is determined by how much it was polished by milling. So that means how long it was is ground, you know. Polished rice that's been ground for a long time can be stored longer. And it cooks faster. So those are those are good things that make people want to polish the rice. But it is not as nutritious. And it is also a huge amount of work. So it would be kind of rare. That would be kind of imperial taxes because it got to last long enough to get to them. Absolutely. This is not what even most samurai, I think, would really eat polished rice because it takes a long time to process to get it that way. It's also considered to taste better. I think if you have brown rice versus white rice, I think a lot of people like the taste of the white rice better. But when you talk about being less nutritious, that was really significant. There are cases of, I believe Edo, like they was called Edo disease because all the very fancy schmancy people, as they got more money, wanted the fancy schmancy polished rice. And they were literally coming down with berry berry because that's a vitamin deficiency, because they were only eating polished rice and they weren't getting the, the, the vitamins they needed. So it was, it was a serious problem. Yes. So that's a, that's a thing your samurai might want to have a think about. <laughs> right. And that's why we say it is unlikely that samurai who are healthy, like, like actual fighting samurai, would be eating polished rice because you just it's, it's yeah. nutritious enough to sustain your wealthy samurai would also be eating vegetables and fish and and, and this and that, that and the other thing so they wouldn't just be uh, eating rice but yeah there's there's a lot to be said for having the bran on there so and then in winter the rice is stored it's in stored in in casks or um cloth bundles or bags And we see these traditional koku koku bags of tightly bound rice. And it's always stored above a ground level uh, to help keep it dry and to prevent rodents. And this is part of the reason why Japanese houses in general are traditionally like a few feet above the ground. Yeah. Uh, Because if they were right against the ground, it's easy for rodents to get in and eat eat your rice. Yeah, rodents and moisture. If you've got like an air passage underneath then it's going to stay drier longer it's also good for heat because it got really hot so you would you, you would have cooled things down so yeah that was one of the many reasons why everything was like up on stilts a little bit so that's the general cycle of rice which is obviously a very very important part of the rural life so let's have a look at how things might differ between individual clans let's start with the crab we have an example in one of the fictions of Kurosanai Village, which was featured, that's where Katsuo of the Battle of Cherry Blossom Snow fame comes from, famous runner-up in that battle. He came from Kurosanai Village. 
Crowd villages will tend to be insular, wary of outsiders, and the door's always barred to everyone at night. Generally, there won't be very many Ashigaru present in the villages, unless the crab are off fighting other clans, which is not that common. The Ashigaru will be in it, in the villages unless there is a war with other clans, because we don't use the Ashigaru on the wall. No. Now they, there's some, some Ashigaru are used in support positions, but they generally aren't used in the front line. So they're helping with the villages. So a lot of things where you'd see a samurai dealing with village matters, you will see Ashigaru on that kind of level instead, precisely for that reason. Magistrates patrol a number of villages together, and villagers are permitted weapons, are expected to learn at least the basics of fighting. And this is because every so often something unpleasant gets through the wall or around the wall or whatever, and the villagers may have to deal with it. This actually leads to an interesting thing where the crab villagers and the the peasantry feel rather more that they and the samurai working together than I think happens in a lot of other clans. They feel all part one part of one big family because of that, which is an interesting dynamic. <laughs> in the crane, you are going to have very organized villages. Um, the crane have a lot of wealth, but the crane get their wealth from farming and the goods that they create, basically. They are going to have plenty of public goods that benefit the farming and the villages. So they'll have flood control, cleared areas. They put resources into governance mm. in a way that other clans think that such things might not be the place of samurai. Uh, you know, the crane are going to put that into governance because they think that there are you know, non-magic, non-war things are really appropriate for samurai to be doing. Yeah. So they'll have lots of cleared areas and, and lots of, you know, irrigation types of things like that. The Ashigaru and Cranelands are in the villages many years. Crane tend to use G-Samurai rather than Ashigaru to support their combat troops. An exception or a problem was that in 11... 23 when the game is set it's a time of high war for the crane so the ashigaru are definitely yeah called up and um they're archers uh more than frontline spearsmen for for the crane crane villages will be very open they will be expected to be very courteous to samurai guests they will have well-maintained inns and open homes in the crane, traditionally, storytellers and Asahina healers will often travel across crane lands to the villages because you got to practice your arts on villagers before you're allowed to practice on samurai. <laughs> We've talked about the peace war axis and what that means. With the tsunami, in the current setting of the game, it's a little shifted in, in, from what it would be without it. Because of that, famine and high tax burdens are definitely a factor in Cranelands. So this is this is in a bad place on the peace war axis in Cranelands in 1123. I mean, not only do you have the actual war that's going on, which is going to disrupt things, but it's only three years since a devastating tsunami, which would have killed a whole bunch of villagers. They would have displaced a whole bunch of villagers. There's going to be places that are completely abandoned because there's salt everywhere and the crane haven't had the resources to fix it yet. You're going to have places where there's been a big influx of new people because they've been displaced and they may not have. I mean, there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff going on. Yeah. All these public works that the crane do are are destroyed, which... yep. Is very necessary, as we talked about, for how rice production works. Mm -hmm. Even if you're really far away from the ocean, nobody's giving out tax breaks just because you had a tsunami destroy half your rice fields. Nope. So the whole amount of imperial tax that needed to be paid, and we kind of saw this in her father's daughter, yeah. is still being demanded despite the tsunami, which means... All the rest of Crane Lands has to fork out that much rice. There was a certain amount of pride with the Crane where they didn't want to be seen to ask for handouts. Absolutely. So they don't want to necessarily ask for handouts either. Yep. 
if you see seen as weak, that's a significant problem. So between all of that, this is not necessarily normal times for the crane, but that's kind of where it would be normal and how it's shifted. Yep. Meanwhile, way up north in Dragonlands, the villagers are going to tend to be quite isolated because the Dragonlands are very rugged. There are places where it is more open, certainly closer to the Dragonfly Lands, where it is probably closer to more traditional places. But you're going to have isolated rural villages on rugged land. Very often they don't have much samurai protection and they're far away from supervision which is a combination of the low population, but also the general philosophy of people should find their own path, which does mean that a bad local ruler can operate for years and without being dealt with. The farms are going to be way more marginal than in a lot of other clans, so a bad winter can cause a lot of hunger. With the lowered birth rate, you're also going to find abandoned villages, you're going to find villages that are having problems because they just don't have the labour to farm the lands that they have, not going to have as many children wandering about. And that is also because sometimes children get recruited to become samurai to replace that population. So you're going to have a lot of isolated places that are even more isolated than normal because there's got this declining birth rate going on. You'll also notice that the dragon will almost certainly terrace the absolute last possible inch of land because that is pretty much going to be the only way they're going to get enough farmland. So you're going to have the entire mountainsides that have been engineered into rice growing. And uh, we're going to have some links to some images of that in our show notes. It's a very distinctive landscape for that reason. Right. But building those terraces, and of course, we've talked about how labor intensive rice is. Yep. When you don't have the kids, you don't have the, the population. Difficult to maintain. It's a spiral in either direction. So, yep. Absolutely. So, the lion are well organized. Mm hmm. And they are what little we've seen uh, of the lion, they are very religiously devoted villagers. Uh, and especially their Ashikaru. They they strongly believe that their sacrifices in this life will grant them a better future life. The lion are most likely to have professional Ashigaru. Most villages have all their Ashigaru gone every year because even in, not in times of war, the lion are very big on keeping their Ashigaru disciplined and well trained and very professional acting right? Yeah, absolutely. Not something they're going to let their villages practice on their own. So like if your Ashigaru are archers, then that's something that the villagers can practice on their own mm -hmm. without a huge amount of discipline. But the lion use Ashigaru spearmen and working in spears requires formation work. Yeah, there'll be lots of exercises every summer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's just how Spear Ashigaru would have to work. Yeah. This tends to mean that much of the time, the villagers are of the old and the injured and the very young. But the lion armies are very well situated. The areas are very well patrolled. And the lion fields in general are quite fertile mm -hmm. and not necessarily with rice. Yeah. They do grow rice, of course, but these are the areas that are going to have a lot of barley and and grain crops because you have these lion plains. Most of their people are not super into building public works and stuff because, as samurai just because their public works in general are going to be more along the lines of building of protection and uh, reinforcement military things. So they might be more interested in building storehouses so that they can store their rice and that, that sort of thing and supply it for journey, but not necessarily building big irrigation systems or that kind of that kind of product. At least that's my understanding. One Another thing that will be quite different is that there probably would be a much greater emphasis on fortunist shrines and fortunist religion amongst the lion, even the peasantry, and less shinseist, and ancestor worship very much so, yeah. And I think ancestor worship is the big one here and how it affects the interaction. So the uh, a lion village is very unlikely to 
be or voice un- unhappiness than maybe any of the other clients. They're less likely to complain because, as I said, if you are a good peasant here, you know for a fact that you will become a good ancestor or a greater person in your next life. And, you know, in what we've seen in some of the stories where we've heard Lion talking about their own Ashigaru, they're believing that, you know, we can throw ourselves into the front line of battle and it's fine because we will benefit in the next life. Mm-hmm. So the Phoenix, by contrast, their community is going to be very tight knit. They're not going to be as isolated as the Dragon Clan, but they're still going to be fairly tight knit because they are still up in the mountains. But their community is going to be very welcoming. They're going to be integrated with nature rather than necessarily just clear cutting forests around them. They're also going to be very religious, although they are going to be much more of a mix between Fortunism and Shinseism. They are going to be accustomed to appealing to the kami and to Shigenja to handle problems, although not, not necessarily public works and such. The Ashigaru, I suspect, may be fewer because the, the Phoenix are generally pacifistic, but the, the, the Ashigaru are going to be mostly in the villages as opposed to out on maneuvers, precisely because the Phoenix try not to start wars or get involved in them. So I think they, there is going to be a, a feeling of harmony yeah. In the Phoenix lands, you're more likely to, if, if there's a flood, you know, if you have a river that floods pretty often, you'd be more likely to p- appeal to the Shigenja to please speak to the flood kami than build flood walls. Absolutely. And that's that sort of thing. Yeah. And appeal more to Inari to grant a good harvest than work on extensive irrigation systems because that would make more sense to them, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and and Ari would. So yeah. <laughs> you have the Shigenja right there. So. Absolutely, absolutely. So that, it's just a different approach. In, in the current timeline, the elemental imbalance would therefore cause more problems to the Phoenix, even if it were universal, because the Kami are not responding the way that they did. And the Phoenix lands are more likely to rely on the Kami responding in a certain way Mm -hmm. in order to produce, as opposed to compelling it through rules of nature, I guess. Yes. (laughs) So in the Scorpion lands, we've not had a whole lot of view of villages. We did have a little bit in the fall of Yoga Castle. These communities, as I see them, would have a certain level of paranoia, you know, very respectful, tight knit, but they would always know that they are being watched. Yeah. By their samurai, by informants, and they would always be expected to be reporting to the scorpion on any visitors who come through. No matter how nice you were to them, they know that the scorpion are going to be looking at them harder than you were nice. Absolutely. That kind of paranoia was really actually a part of the Edo period because the Tokugawa shoguns didn't want to get overthrown because they had overthrown the the Toyotomi and they didn't want that happening to them. And so there was a certain amount of paranoia to the extent that there was a joke that like, there was a secret policeman for every single individual. You know, that was that was the kind of level of paranoia. I reckon that the Scorpion clan commoners would be an excellent place to, you know, if you want to, you want to steal plot lines from those kinds of stories, the Scorpion lands are the place to do it because that would be the feeling. Absolutely. Right. I'm not saying this to diss on Scorpion. No, 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 no. They're villagers. I'm just saying that this makes sense and this was, was common. So Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's a good land to have it have that work in. And, and also every second village was, was also a, a ninja training school. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Shinobi. Shinobi training school. Shinobi training school. You know, I ta- I, I've taught places in my blog about legalism, but but the Scorpion believe in balancing a lot of carrots and sticks. So they will have lots of festivals. They will have 
times when they are incredibly generous to their villagers to keep them appeased, to keep them happy. Scorpion celebrations are probably incredibly generous affairs compared to what is standard for other villages. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is they also have a lot of sticks. So punishments for breaking the rules are probably extremely intimidating and help build up this this air of of paranoia among the villagers. So you probably see some of the more harsh punishments of anywhere in the empire in Scorpio Lands. The, the main difference is that it's not arbitrary. It's not, I feel like punching some peasants today. It's because remember that the Scorpion actually are the ones who created imperial law. So they're going to be probably very legalistic for their people you broke the rules, therefore this punishment is happening. But it will be a, a strong punishment. Yes. Another Edo period thing I, would, I think you could steal for the scorpion is this thing where you divvy up your households into groups of five. And there's one person who is like the head of that five household group. And they are responsible for any wrongdoing by that group. Right. And that's, that's just the way it is. So you've got to police yourself because that's another really you know, really harsh things could happen if you if you go against the, the rules. And that, again, that, that kind of gives that kind of paranoia. You know, we, we can't be seen to be helping wrongdoers. Everyone has to be correct, that kind of thing. But if you stick within the rules, if you don't break the law, you're going to be treated pretty well. So I think that could be another thing to steal from a common trope in samurai fiction. So scorpion lands, depending on which version of the map you ha look at, are, are often in pretty swampy ground, at least if you look at pictures and stuff. So so these are often going to have the, the stilt villages in the swamp. Conveniently, that means that there's places to hide bodies. Yes. <laughs> Which might be relevant, you know. Um, we'll just put that out there for <laughs> your scorpion villages. I, I kind of associate that with the yoga lands because yoga lands sound like they'll be really depressing. <laughs> it's just kind of gloom. Everyone's really gloomy. Yeah. yeah. Why are there swamps here? Just everyone's, everyone's just so sad. They moved all the swamps here so everyone could be appropriately gloomy. <laughs> uh, so finally, we're going to have a look at the unicorn. So the unicorn in the south have long-established villages, possibly very similar to the lion villages in a way, certainly in the infrastructure, because they were actually under lion control for so long. They are patrolled by the unicorn. The unicorn pass through fairly irregularly, but they're going to be like the mainstay bread basket, they, well, rice basket, I suppose, because they're going to be established very much like your more standard Rokugani villages, even though they are going to have a lot of unicorn culture. In the north where it's more open and it seems a bit more moto, if you see what I mean, you're more likely to have these kind of frontier villages that are semi-nomadic, so they will disappear and reappear as the land is cleared of resources or if the need for whatever resource they need is getting from that area, if that need is no longer there, they'll kind of pack up and move along. So things are a little more transient up in the north Villages tend to be independent and self-sustaining because it might be a long time before you see a unicorn patrol. And given that the entirety of the samurai population seems to be mounted, villages can be quite a long way away. And, and so the nearest authority can be quite a distance if you personally don't have a horse. So you're going to have to be fairly self-reliant. So, and, and obviously... They are going to be rather more Moto and thus rather more Mongol influenced villages. As, and I think the further you go north, the further that is going to get, and the further you go west as well. Like on on the lion borders close to that area, I think that's going to look very traditional, traditional rock and gunny. But that's going to go gradually more and more not traditional the further away you get. Yeah. So the people in these kinds of villages, because they have so much independence, the unicorn pride themselves on compassion. Unlike almost well, pretty much all the other clans where there's kind of like a little bit different rules for <laughs> peasants and samurai, the unicorn are not timid in big punishments, but they are incredibly even handed about it. So if 
a samurai does something to a peasant that's against the rules, um, they're going to end up in, in big trouble. And one thing, at least from earlier editions, it hasn't been mentioned later, but one thing is this, that the unicorn will use punishments that the rest of the empire will consider somewhat barbaric, mm. but they and are administered extremely fairly. Closer to what we see as fair, I rather suspect a lion person would say, that's not fair at all. How dare you? That's that's treating samurai the same as pets. That's not fair. And the unicorn are going, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> what? Right. So since since the unicorn come around rarely, the punishments they they want do want to make a big effect. Yeah. Right. So I, don't do this, or you can have this bad thing happen to you. Yeah, it's very strong, but it's very justly administered. And the unicorn definitely believe in mercy where it's earned. So it's not going to be completely legalistic. It's going to look at the circumstances, and and you know, there's mercy in the equation too. I guess interesting things from Mongol punishments in history, which you might want to bring in because that's probably to a Rokugani person they would seem terribly barbaric and strange but to the Moto would be considered honorable and merciful like it was forbidden to shed noble blood right which could be a problem if someone's done something and they really need to be executed because they did the thing they did was so bad and there were things like you get strangled using a bowstring or, or tied up in a bag and trampled with the horses, both of which sound terrible, admittedly, but I'm not entirely sure that getting your head chopped off is much nicer. But to someone from Rokugan, from very traditional Rokugan, those are, oh my God, that is so barbaric. But from the income point of view, no, this is, this is much nicer than, than shedding blood. So I think that, that, that could be an excellent, an excellent kind of having people with very different viewpoints trying to get along. I think that could be a, a, a neat thing to bring up. Right. So the next thing we kind of wanted to talk about was uh, just just give you some images that you can um, sprinkle in your campaigns for things that people might see in villages and your players are going through a village um, that, you know, you don't always stay in villages very long, but I think it's always helpful to have a a few like short little images that you can use that really give an impression about what a village is is like um, while you're going through. Yeah. So one of these villages, of course, is the hundred percent classic one, which is having the peasants up to their knees in the rice paddies planting these shoots of rice. Uh, often they'll carry them in a basket on their back and they'll just grab them and plant them in the soil there. You see that in every movie. So we'll try and give you some that is not that image, but that is, of course, the quintessential image. <laughs> you also often see at the harvest time, you see rice, beans, and so forth spread across a broad courtyard to be dried or laid out in wide, flat baskets. So that's a very common sight just after the harvest. Like we were mentioning pre previously, that's an important part of the growing and then the harvesting process. Yeah. Uh, wells are pretty common or, or springs uh, in these villages. And you're going to see people just gathered at the well with big jars of water, uh, filling up their jars of water. And that's where everybody meets. Everybody walks up to the spring each day and fills it up and carries their water back to their house. And they're going to be talking and gossiping. And that's just like every morning. Yep. Yeah. Essentially around the water cooler, only instead it's around the well or around the spring. Many houses are going to have little backyard gardens of vegetables, whereas in a samurai home, the gardens are strictly ornamental. These are going to be practical herb and vegetable gardens. So everything in, in neat rows and working at it to um, grow extra food for the family. Mm -hmm. You're going to see people during the day 
doing things like weaving baskets in their doorways, you know, as they talk or just watch people go by because weaving baskets is boring inside in the dark. <laughs> um, they're going to be in the in the stream washing clothes, beating clothing against the rocks, that sort of thing to do it. Or, you know, sewing and otherwise uh, doing crafting and repairing stuff. And you're going to also have festivals for pounding rice with sledgehammers to bake mochi. There are going to be the big public works where everyone gets together to put together better irrigation systems or repairing fences, walls, or rice paddy walls. That's going to be another classic image. So we don't have a whole lot of mechanics related to villages, of course. We do have rural farmland ronin. Mm -hmm. in Path of Ways, where if you come from rural farmland, you get plus one earth and plus one fitness. And you get to generally have a strong idea of farming and knowledge of the local area and local politics. And generally a, a somewhat higher status flavor of Ronin than some of the other kinds of Ronin, if you come from rural farm farmland, it's a little bit more respected than if you came from a city. And honestly, I reckon, and this is probably true of a lot of Path of Waves backgrounds, you'd actually be fairly reasonable to drop that in instead of a normal family background. If you say, well, I'm Miramoto, but I'm from the farmlands, you know, that would, that, you, could, you could drop that in reasonably well, I think. And I think that's true of a lot of the backgrounds. You know, I, I was born halfway up a mountain, even if I'm, um, you know, a gasher or, or whatever, Asahina. Mm -hmm. So having looked at the mechanics that are associated with the rural villages, let's think about some adventure ideas, because honestly, there's an awful so lot. So many. <laughs> so many. So let's just start off with one. Like maybe the rice paddies around a village, they start dying you know one field at a time there's some problem with them everyone thinks maybe it's a supernatural thing maybe that's it's some kind of you know the kami are unhappy with this maybe inari has been displeased but if the samurai maybe the pc start guarding the fields then it stops happening these fields stop dying and maybe it turns out that it's a rival village poisoning the fields and killing the rice at night as revenge for a past theft that they blame this village for that's one thing. Since Rokugan has so much supernatural stuff, the first assumption people will make on many circumstances would be it's supernatural. But people are able to do some pretty dastardly things on their own. So so getting, catching your PCs that way is, is always slightly amusing to me. <laughs> uh, bandits keeping a village and forcing it to supply them with foods and goods and stuff. Yeah. And they obey them out of fear. Or maybe the bandits have been protecting the village and the village wants the bandits to protect them back. So you could have a bandage village interaction that works in either either direction and your PCs coming into it do not know which. Yes, they don't know whether they're doing a southern samurai because that could literally be what it seems to be. Like, oh no, we're being attacked by these bandits. Would, would the seven of you like to come and protect us? And then it turns out to be, no, no, we'll be looking after these bandits and they're not, they're not holding up their end of the bargain. I think that could be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Sounds cool. I like that one. A classic. Yeah, there's been a murder. Always, always classic start to an adventure. <laughs> it's a very insular, suspicious village. One of those ones where everyone's suspecting everybody else. And it turns out that if you start asking, okay, who's our motive? And it turns out, Everyone, everyone has a motive, <laughs> including the village dog for some reason. And like literally, literally everyone, when you start, you start looking through it and sort of, well, everyone was, there was a moment where, where this person, they had the motive and no one knows where they were for this hour. But this person here was also doing a bit suspicious thing. So it could be absolutely anyone. But then it turns out it was just an accident. It turns out it was no one. Kind of the reverse murder on the Orient Express. Yes. Another idea is like children in a very poor village in troubled times keep disappearing and the villagers are desperate to find them and call on the samurai for aid. And it turns out that a spirit of Chukshido, 
kitsune or some other kind of spirit, a tengu mm. uh, or a kenku, I should say, um, has decided that it pities the children. Uh, and the people want the villagers to come home, but this spirit feels like the circumstances the children were in in the village were so poor that it has led them into its protection where they can have fun and have enough to eat and be happy children under its protection. But, you know, the villagers want their children back. So now the children themselves aren't sure if they want to go home, if they even remember it, because Chixido does Chixido things to them uh, to maybe make them forget. So, again, this is a, a scenario where there's no vanilla bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a very complicated uh, situation to put your... PCs in so kind of a Pied Piper of Hamlin absolutely sort of concept and give give your give your high flutin PCs the high little PCs right now now it's an intrigue you have to convince these children to come home go <laughs> <laughs> it's a thing it's a thing anyway, I hope that was a couple of adventures many adventures in L5R in the standard modules that take place in villages. So I'm sure that you will find more, but uh, hopefully that gave you some good ideas. There's some villages detailed in Path of Waves and the adventure that are, that came with us and the download of content for it, which was Sins of Regret, also features very heavily around a village. So that's the thing to look out for. But that's it for this week. I wanted to give a call out to our Court Games Network including our two actual role-playing podcasts, Crimson Gold Agonies and Fortune and Strife, as well as our friends at D20 Radio. Our content is funded by the Community Discord Patreon, which supports our editing costs as well as our website, where we can find and store long-term information, summaries of our podcasts, great RPG tools, forums, and more. And for our patrons, we have special bonus content like Adventure Seeds and early access to our actual play podcasts. Online, you can find us at our website at courtgamespod.com and on Twitter at twitter.com slash courtgamespod and on Patreon at patreon.com slash courtgames. But that's it for us this week. This is Kokita Kaori. May the fortunes favor you. And I have been Korva. And until we meet again, keep your jade handy.